Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Indie Film Academy podcast. Today we're talking to Birdman co-screenwriter and recent Oscar winner Alex Dinleris. So, you better hold on to your butt. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Boff. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jason Boff. Today we're going to be talking with Alex Dinleris, who, if you don't don't know just won the Oscar for best screenwriter or co-screenwriter of Birdman. Um, we're, today we're going to be talking with Alex about screenwriting, and it's you know if you're a screenwriter, really pay attention to this episode because I learned a ton, and it's just amazing to hear um, somebody who is at that level talk about what's going through his mind when he's writing and everything. So you know it's kind of I consider it kind of a masterclass in screenwriting. Unfortunately, the telephone connection was not all that great, so you might have to pay a little more attention on this one to to get every word. But trust me, it's worth it. Now, don't forget to go to indiefilmacademy.com and sign up for our newsletter. And well, that's about it. Here we go. So is, have things kind of gone back to normal, or or is it still kind of crazy? This is normal as things are right now because we. we, we it just so happens, you know, things in in every facet of this business take about two years to happen, and and um, it just so happens that everything happened at the same time. So I have, as um, soon as the awards were over, we came back on Monday. Uh, the next morning, actually, we barely even slept. We went from uh, the last party of the night, like the dollar party, straight to the car. Nuts. Um, but 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 on Tuesday, I had to be back in the writers room for the television show. Um, so there was no sort of lag there. And then I'm, I'm working on a script with Guillermo del Toro, so we're working on that simultaneously. And we're tuning up this musical. Um, so I've been working on sort of three things, you know, at the same time. So it's, I haven't really... It's just less traveling, you know, and all the Oscar push and all that, but it's still a lot of... A lot of people work and have two babies at home. So uh, I haven't been able to rest. I'm hoping in the beginning of May I'll, I'll get a week away and just with my family to, to, to unwind and chill out. Right. Yeah. Does it? I mean, does it affect your creative process to have everything kind of on top of you, or do you work better with stress like that? <laughs> um, I think I constantly work with stress. I don't know if I work better with stress. Um, it's, a little, <laughs> it's a little challenging just because generally if, if you're working on one project, when you're in your off time, you know, like if you're making dinner for the kids or – uh, walking the dog or, or whatever, your subconscious is working on the job you're on. So let's say that was Birdman. When you have multiple projects, it doesn't really happen that way because you're thinking about too many things. So it sort of takes more focus, if you know what I mean? Like you, you have to literally concentrate and put your brain toward which project you're, you're thinking about at that moment. Um, so that's the difference. So what is it like? Where, so you're working on a project with Guillermo de Toro. Um, what what has that been like? Yeah, it was great. I mean, we we met a while ago um, through through Alejandro, and then he had this little sort of personal movie he wanted to make and approached me, and the the idea was so beautiful. He's he's sort of this like, in the, I mean this in the best way. He's like a like he has the imagination of a like a brilliant child. Like there's nothing, he's not, <laughs> he's not, he's not boxed in by, by reality in a way. And in the best right. way, I mean, in the sort of poetic way, and I think if you look at Pan's Labyrinth and or Hellboy or Pacific Rim or, you know, it's such a spectrum of stuff that he's done, but it's amazingly adrenalizing to sit with him because the imagination can go anywhere and then you, anything can be possible, which is just amazing. Have you ever seen his sketches and his notebooks? I'm, I, he, I, some, but he's sh- he's going to show me. We're going to get there in a couple of weeks, and he's going to bring me a whole uh, series of them, and then I'm going to go visit him in his in his, in his house. And he, I can't wait. Uh, I'm sort of afraid. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Is he in Mexico City? Uh, no, he lives in Toronto. Oh, okay. He lives I, in Toronto I, I and travels around, and I'm in New York, so we're not that far away from each other. Okay. Yeah, his his. I think they've even published some of his. Uh, you know, book of sketches and everything. They're kind of legendary at this point. Amazing. Um, so I wanted to jump in with kind of a discussion of screenwriting and your process. And, and the IFA is primarily um, for education. Um, so if if I can, I would really like to kind of um, discuss your process for writing and, you know, talk about, for example, if, if we could start out by talking about how you start with a project and how you – Take, you know, 
kind of all the ideas you have and then build that into a screenplay and your process of working on that. So, for example, let me let me give you an actual question. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so you say I've heard some of your other interviews and you talk about putting a you know having a blueprint before you actually start with your first draft. Can you talk about the process behind creating that blueprint? Yeah, for me, depending on what the story is going to be, and it doesn't it doesn't sort of matter what what um, what medium I'm in. For example, now I'm working on a musical for Broadway. I'm working on a television series with my Birdman cohorts, and I'm working on a on a film. Um, but what I find everything in common is you need to. For me, I need to get the structure in order. Um, if I can understand the entire structure of it then it's easy for me to tie together sort of scenes and leitmotifs and everything that will make it cohesive. If I, some people sort of write from the first page and as if they're holding a flashlight and step every five feet and they see that far in front of them and just keep going until they get somewhere. Um, I can't work that way. For me, I need to know, in a way, I need to know what where the end is or at least what the vicinity of the end is. I think for me, the, the sort of Aristotelian philosophy of surprising inevitability is the most important thing I know, is to get to an ending that's at once surprising and absolutely inevitable. Holy cow, I can't believe that happened, and of course that happened. They've been telling me that was going to happen for the last two hours. Um, and in order for me to get there, I sort of have to know at least the zip code of where I'm starting and the zip code of where I'm going to finish. You know what I mean? So so I, I map everything out to death, and I stare at that structure in front of my face, whether it's on my bulletin board, on cards, or on paper. I sketch, I sketch you know, uh, charts a lot, and I stare at it and stare at it and stare at it. And like I was saying before, as I'm doing other things generally, like, just, you know, you work a little bit, and as I'm living my life, I say, oh, that's a scene, yeah. And I look at the structure right there, where would that, how does that fit in? And slowly it comes together sort of like a puzzle. And then once I have enough scenes sitting within the structure itself, then I'll procrastinate for as long as I humanly can um, <laughs> to avoid writing. And then I'll finally, when I can't hold it anymore, I generally like to go away because there are just too many distractions. I'm not the kind of person who can wake up at 6 in the morning and work from 6 to 9 every day like some people do. It's just incredible to me. I wish I could. Um but I'll sort up. Of, I'll know the structure inside out. I know the basic framework and story, and then I'll go away. Sometimes I go to this little place. It's not fancy at all, but it's in Puerto Rico on the west coast, and in Isabella, and and there's no internet really. Speaking of, you have to sort of go to the office to get into it, but barely a phone. Certainly no TV or distraction. And I'll just spend a week or ten days there and hammer out a draft. So I wrote a draft of Birdman there. I wrote a draft of um, my play Red Dog Howls there. I wrote the On Your Feet, Gloria Step on Musical there. Um, but that can only come to me, like I said, after I've looked at the structure and I know it just inside out, which could take months. You know, in, in some cases it could take eight or nine months. Sometimes it's a little shorter. Uh, but for me, structure is everything. And even when you're going to make a, a film like Birdman, which seems like a fever dream, you know, Alejandro just you know, being his genius maniac self, you know, if you're going to take a flight of fancy that big, you had better be steeped in structure. And, you know, Nicolas and myself, you know, as crazy as Birdman looks, structure it, you know, just vigorously. Um, right. Uh, because we thought if we had a very strong foundation, then we would be able to take the crazy leaps, uh, you know, pardon the Birdman reference, but to, <laughs> to take the leaps of faith and, and just jump and, um, so for me, that's what structure is. Structure for me is, is, is the road. So at least I know I can, I can drive on, you know, and I, it, it, right. it's everything for me. Now, when you're creating that blueprint, are you assuming that once you get into the writing process, a lot of that creative, um, a lot of the ideas are going to take over and you can kind of like go off of your blueprint or yeah. are you trying to put everything that you possibly can into the blueprint before you start writing so you know where the jokes are and you know where the everything's going to go? Well, a little bit of both. The, 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 the latter part less. Um, I, I make a structure that holds the story. I know where the story is turning. I know sort of what the themes are again, what, what my leitmotifs are, you know, that, that, that weave it together and, and everything. But yes, on the other hand, once I have it, I feel so confident that I know where it's going, that I have no fear there. In a way, I'm always afraid to write, you know. 
but I, right. I'm, not, I'm not afraid. I don't know what the story is. And so I'm able to take a breath and close my eyes and let my imagination and let my subconscious sort of take over a little bit. And so, yeah, okay. then, then it starts to find its own weirdness and life and, and, and strange moments may come. Like, I don't plan those moments in advance. I just plan the structure of the story in advance and then let the imagination take over. And is that where you think, for example, you say the surprising inevitability, does that come from, like, the sitting down and writing and just, like, going in directions that you didn't think of, but it just came as you were kind of, like, impro improvising and writing and in the world? Yeah, if you look at, for example, and this is, this is a, a few of us um, writing, um, but when Alejandro gave us a basic idea of what he wanted to do, is there a film in one long take and... You know, we, we, there's this middle-aged guy floating around in his underwear at the beginning. That's an image Alejandro just, <laughs> he just had in his head, you know. Uh, uh, but when you look at Birdman, for example, when you talk about surprising that ability, for whatever anybody, you know, because people love Birdman, people hate Birdman, it's a very polarizing film, uh, and the ending's polarizing. But in the end, when you look at that film, the first image, the first scene of that film is a guy, and if you forget that he's in his underwear, and you forget that he's floating three feet off the ground for a minute, you realize it's a man meditating. Once you see it's a man meditating, you realize, you say, okay, what's the fundamental value of meditation? And that's to silence the voice in your head, right? That's what meditation is, to right. silence everything out. Well, in the last scene of this movie, for better or worse, he does exactly that. Do you know what I mean? Or you could say on stage he does that. But at the end of this film, he does exactly what he was doing in the first scene of this film, which is trying to silence that voice in his head. In the case of Birdman, that voice is the Birdman himself, or his ego. But you can see where that's surprisingly inevitable. Surprising because, holy cow, either whatever you choose, the people that hated the ending where he jumps, or the people that love the ending where he shoots himself, um, who, who's one sort of an epilogue, you know? But, but you look at it and you say, holy cow, let's just say he shot himself. Um... And then you say, of course he shot himself. He was trying to quiet that voice in the head. They told me that in the first scene. Mm -hmm. so, so the rest of the journey is going to be that. And so you get to a point where it's both surprising, and if you're paying attention, inevitable. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? He's floating in the yeah. first frame. He leaves at the end. And people are like, does he fly or does he fall? Well, that's up to you, but he was floating in the first scene. So is that something you realized when you were starting and creating this, that this is kind of how it's going to end? Well... The ending was always going to... The epilogue was the harder part because Alejandro felt strongly that mm -hmm. if he decided the fate of Regan Thompson, then he was deciding the fate of the audience themselves. So mm -hmm. he wanted them to make that commitment, that decision. And when you talk to people, some people say he died. Some people have these incredible, elaborate theories about how Emma Stone's character <laughs> snap, breaks with reality and... Um, right. and how he's already dead and laughing and that, you know, because people just want to innately satisfy themselves with the story. Um, Alejandro just, he felt like if he, if he, whatever he said, if he said what definitely happened to, to Regan Thompson, then he, it would be small. But if the audience was forced to take a leap themselves and either have childish um, hope or very pragmatic and cynical, you know, anger, one way or another, they were gonna, it was going to say more about them and their own selves than it would be about, you know, the film itself. But the basic structure of the film, then, from the meditation to when he shoots himself on stage and gets the standing ovation, which is just before the end. And if you look at that, if you look at just the structure of that chunk of script, it, it's incredibly structured, you know. He loses this person... Uh, uh, Mike Shiner comes in sort of right there at the end of Act One. Um, you know, the previews right around Act Two. Um, the critic at the beginning of Act Three says, I'm going to destroy your play. She's his last hope, so he's screwed. So it has a primal structure to it. And once we had that, then we were able to go bananas in between and try to tell the story we wanted to tell. Now, you had mentioned it being also kind of a hero's journey. Is there any, like, Joseph Campbell going on with this? Or yeah, of it... course. I mean... I think there's Joseph Campbell going on in mostly anything, isn't there? Um, <laughs> but, but it's that, here's a man who's playing, when you, when you talk about this sort of the, the, the mythical um, stature of, of what Birdman is to him and what Birdman is to people and how these people are seeking that 
that moment where they can feel special. I mean, it's a movie about ego. Um, so these things are big. And when you look at an antagonist, people get confused because the critic, for example, she's antagonistic, but she's not the antagonist, right? Because a man who's silencing the voice in his head, naturally, if that voice is ego, then, then that's the antagonist, isn't it? The only antagonist in Birdman is Reedy Thompson himself, right? He's the one that gets in his way. He's the one that's ruining his relationships. He's the one that keeps telling him he's special. He's the one that gets himself in trouble. Um, so it does have this sort of larger mythical, you know, Joseph Campbell-esque um, quality, as does, I think, any story inside, you know, about a human being inside. Now, when you when you write, are you, um, is it, like, when you you say you go to Puerto Rico and you kind of, like, isolate yourself, is that because you need to completely live in that world for a little bit and live with those characters and kind of go into your head and just kind of, like, be there without, you know, kids running around and, and interaction? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if I'm going to be very honest about that, I, I really do believe I have some level of ADD or ADHD. I, I, <laughs> I already have a tough enough time focusing at all, but when you right. have, when you have, for example, your email ringing, you know, beeping a hundred times a day and, you know, the kids running around, it's impossible to get to the quiet place. And for me, a huge part a huge chunk of time of my writing process, even when I'm away, is laying on a bed looking at the ceiling. You know, or sitting I'm down in Puerto Rico just sitting on the on the little they have little these little porches and I just sit there and look at the you know, at the ocean and um or the sea as it were. Um and I spend a lot of time and I'll just wait and I'll wait and I'll run it through in my head and I'm the idea comes, I'll sit down at the computer and write out the idea. So it's this really this game of patiently waiting and me not not forcing it. Um, so that's, I need the space to be able to do that in the quiet and the stillness to be able to, to do that. Otherwise, I, I, I find myself manipulating or forcing everything. And I can't write that way. I'm no good at it. Some people are great at it. I'm, I'm terrible. And forcing, you mean like people who force themselves to sit down and write and create stuff or people who. Yeah, they say, know. damn it, I know where the story's going and I'm going to write 15 pages a day, you know, and they just, whether they're good pages or bad pages. I, I, I can go on a space where I don't, even when I'm away and I have 10 days to come back with a draft, I, I, I can go a full day without writing a word, you know, and it, which is scary as hell because it always feels like, oh, my God, this is the time it's not going to come. You know, this is the time I'm not going to get it. Um, and it's really an act of faith, and I, I guess it's made better by having succeeded a few times, so you, you sort of have a little bit of faith, but I swear to God, it, it's just as frightening every single time. You're like, this is the time it ain't gonna happen. You know, this is the time everybody finds out I'm a, I'm a fraud. <laughs> and that's a really genuine feeling, I swear. You just have, you have your greatest hits album, but you're not making any more new hits after that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> like, how do I, what do I write next? Right. Yeah. So, but when you finally sit down, is it like, is it difficult to write that first draft? I mean, is it as painful as a lot of, for you as like, you know, I remember Lawrence Kasdan mentioned that it was just like, it was always torture for him to sit down and write a first draft. Um, that's funny that Larry said that. Um, I know Larry well because I did the bodyguard with him. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> the, the musical. Um, right. No. I think less for me because, I mean, it's always terrifying, but I don't think it's terrifying for that for me for the same reason in fear of being redundant. For the same reason, is that I know the parameter. I know, you know, I know the tune. I just, I just gotta go piece by piece and, and put it together. Um, so that scares me less. I mean, I'm always scared, but I think I have a little more trust because I can see the story laid out in front of me. All, all that's left for me is, and I don't know who said it. You must have heard this in the course, but somebody once said that writing was like, um, I think writing narrative was like, as opposed to creating something that was like brushing off the dirt off a fossil, you know, you, you go little by little until you realize what you have. And for me, it absolutely feels like that. It feels like you just wait and you're like, it'll come. And then the, the story already exists. All the moments already exist. It's about being quiet enough and having your sort of structure and your, and your sense of what the story is down, understanding your themes, and then just waiting and just keep sifting off the dust. And you go, oh, right, right, that. Um, and then the story gets uncovered. I mean, I, I really do feel that way. 
So what is the process for developing characters? Like when you were writing Birdman, did the, the characters start just kind of developing? And I know you were working with, um, with Nico. Nico on that. And yeah. Did you guys kind of like, I mean, were you, do you start out by looking inward and saying, okay, I've got a guy here who's meditating, trying to get rid of the voices. And then you kind of, do you relate that to yourself or are you kind of like mimicking in a way other people or how do you create those characters? Um, in the case of Birdman, it's, it's different because there's really sort of uh, a few of us working. Um, so Regan, when it was going to be about ego and sort of Alejandro looking at his middle-aged self and his ego, um, he had a sense of what that guy was. So for Nico and I, it was about characterizing behavior. The more behavior we could give him, the more the character started to, we started to understand it better. Um, but in the case of, say, Mike Shiner, uh, I'm, I'm from the theater, you know, I'm a theater creature, um, so I know that guy, um, and I am that guy a little bit. I, I had all the people that I work with here in New York when they saw that first scene in the, in the kitchen when he was talking about, no, what's the action, and don't be redundant and all that, they're like, oh my God, I was having nightmares flashbacks of you yelling at me at rehearsal. <laughs> um, so, so you bring something of yourself into it. Um, and in other cases, like, for me, the ones that were close to me that I was writing, because I feel like Nico and Alejandro really had more of a grasp when I followed their lead on Regan. Um, my characters are really, when you, when you talk about, like, as a group working, you know, you sort of focus on that. Mine were more the Mike Shiner, Emma Stone's character, Sam. Like, those are ones that my voice could, you know, come out in. And, and they were sort of the, the sound of their dialogue sort of with Emma defined who that character was going to be. The, the sort of, that once sort of bitchy and sassy and, you know, precocious. And and on the other side, the sort of really innocent, hopeful, you know, thing. And, and God knows um, how lucky can a human being get to, to have Emma Stone do it because she's a monster. Uh, and the same, by the way, from Michael and, and Ed Norton. I mean, these guys were were blessed. But starting with Sam, for example, it was the dialogue. It was the sound of the dialogue. Was once I'd written that monologue of, you know, you're not important, get used to it, I knew sort of who she was. And Alejandro, we, we all had an idea who she was. But once I started making the sounds come out of her mouth, the character got more and more defined. So I think we all sort of sketched different parts of it. Like Nico had this beautiful moment with... with um, where Michael Keaton has the baloney, and he's like, this play is like a tiny version of himself, like tapping on the balls with a little hammer, you know? Uh-huh. And it's, and <laughs> yeah, it's an absurd, one. beautiful moment, and only Nico, like, that's the mind of Nico. You know, he, he uh-huh. has this, he has this poetic system to himself, um, where I'm much more <laughs> sort of pragmatic and hammering away at the dialogue, and, you know, making more, you know, aggressively... Um, action-oriented scene. And I think that's, and Alejandro is sort of a poet, and so altogether that's what makes it really interesting. I think the collective soup that Birdman became. But finding characters almost always is about, for me, is about A, behavior, and B, the sound of their voice once I start writing it. I learn a lot about them after I see them in the first scene I write. <laughs> now, having your own, you've got two daughters, right? I do, yeah. So is there a part of you that's like, that's your worst nightmare? That, <laughs> is, that, is that, that was literally, that my, to... my, literally my worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I have a four-year-old, and I just imagine her in that spot. <laughs> I, I came home the other day, the other day, what am I saying, the other week, and she said, my mother was taking care of her while we went to the Golden Globes, oh, the other month, I should say. And I came home, and my daughter said, Daddy. The first thing I walked in, she said, Daddy, Daddy, you want a Golden Globe? And I said, yeah. And she said, do you know why? And I said, no, why? She said, because you're the best there is. <laughs> She's a four-year-old. And I said, right. you, I don't know who taught you that, but you remember that for the rest of your life. Because <laughs> when, you're, when you're 16 and you hate me, you better remember you said that one time. I wish I had it on tape. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, Emma and Sam in the movie, that's my worst nightmare of, of, of Maya in, 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 you know, in 15 years or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, that, that's like the the trauma that I have. Like I, I watched. I've got a seven year old son. You know, right. and I was traumatized like watching Boyhood and movies like that. Just yeah. Like, you know, you just want to hold on to the moment because you know that as soon as they get into those teenage years, they're going to completely start changing on you. Yeah, and they're going to want 
they're independent, and then God forbid one day they're going to find out that we're human. <laughs> you know, that we're that we're not God. Because I remember, do you remember that with your parents? Like the day you're like, oh, right. He's actually yeah. a person. <laughs> I'm trying to keep that. people. Yeah, I want to keep that a secret <laughs> as long as I possibly can. Um, okay, so let me get back on track with uh, – now, working with Alejandro, um, when you first heard about the, the concept of the, the film being all one long take and that you wouldn't be able to use – you know, what, what a lot of screenwriters, you know, use is they'll come in early and, and leave – I mean, leave come in late and leave early and yeah. all these little tricks that they kind of hide behind. Was your background in theater helpful in, like, enabling you to – kind of make everything work, you know, end to end, and every scene had to begin with the exact ending of the scene before it? I think that my my experience in theater helped in in the way that, one, you don't get a chance to really write that many monologues for film. You know, film just generally you have, if you have a monologue, you have one big one, and that's the story. Um, th- this is more like a play. Emma has one. Uh, Michael has the one about the jellyfish. Um, he has the one about George Clooney on the plane. Um, you don't use it in theater. You get to do that uh, in, in film. You generally don't. So longer scenes, sort of, I was okay with. I was suited for um, having written for the theater, and then just the experience of the theater itself. I know the theater intimately. I grew up in the theater, um, so that that's something I could bring to the table to the other guys. Um, uh, that was a benefit. And then I'm I'm the only uh, English first language speaker at a bunch of us. Um, so I could help them when it came to really just making the dialogue, you know, sharp and getting their ideas. For example, Nita's idea, not Alejandro, um, would come up with a bunch of ideas and I was able to sort of hammer them into sort of American colloquial, you know, the sort of sound that we, we wanted to hear. So I think that, that those are the things that made me my theater experience brought me and I was able to bring to the group. Um, but, as for Alejandro and the one take, I think the challenge of the one take more than anything else, and I think any writers out there who are hearing or reading or whatever the team is, you understand that what people missed was once we got a shooting draft, we couldn't change it at all. We couldn't edit it at all. And if you really think about that for a minute, you think, okay, well, you wrote a script. You get on set, right? When you get on set, generally, if it seems too long, you can cut it. You can get in the middle. You can change. In ours, the camera was all choreographed, done, finished. So the camera was going to make the movie. So we knew that 95% of everything we wrote was going to make it to the screen. And we couldn't edit it. And it was a comedy. And then the second weapon we have as writers is in post, right? The director can go in, say, oh, this scene feels along, or that joke doesn't work. And you can cut it internally. We couldn't do any of that. So what you see on the screen is literally 95% of the shooting draft. That's as scary as it gets when it comes to writing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like um, you, write, you writing an interview and not being able to edit it later. Right. You're, you're well, are that. there, you know, that begs the question, are there any scenes that you watch now and kind of cringe a little bit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they didn't... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we made mistakes. Um, let's see if I can give you an example without pissing off anybody. <laughs> um <laughs> I feel like there's a scene where we had with um, the first scene with Amy Ryan and Michael when he comes in and he says, I have to sell the Malibu house. And she says to him at one point in the scene, she says, um, you know, what's going on? Talk to me. And he, and he gives the most honest answer. Michael's so good. And he says, I have a chance to do something special and I got to take it. And it's so honest for him. And we're like, oh, my God, that's where you sort of love Regan. And she looks at him, and she's so moved that she says, you know, it's funny, on my way here, I was trying to remember what finally broke us up. And then he goes into a monologue, a narcissistic monologue about being on the plane that was going to be George Clooney's face on the front of the paper if, if it went down and not his. And he does this whole narcissistic monologue, and she says, um, I forgot, she pulls the clip out of his hair, which is Amy. But the scene should have been over there. It should have been, he does the monologue, she says, now I remember. Right? So she says, I forget why we broke up. He says, me, 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 me. She's supposed, she's supposed to say, yeah, I remember now. And get up and go and say, look, it's your house, do what you want with it, but take care of our daughter. And then she turns around and says, you're not there, Reagan. That, that should have been the theme. 
instead we got this longer bit, you know, where she takes the thing out of his hair, she walks, he asks her why did we break up, and it's still good, but it's not as good as if it was edited. Like, if we could have edited it, it would have been a lot better. So, so that scene should have been over, because the action is finished. Once the action, so I think Shanley is a genius, John Patrick Shanley once said, you know, when two characters on stage agree, the scene's over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. and, and yeah. he's being his normal, clever self, but it, it's almost exactly right. And in that scene, they came to an understanding. The scene was over. You don't have to talk about anything else. And if you want, so do you, did you have did you have some sort of like like mental chart or something of like where exactly? Michael Keaton's character was at all times like what what ha- okay we have this scene and this is where he's at now and then this happens to him and this ha- I mean is there some way that you guys were always on the same page with that or was it just the script no it's the, stru- it's the structure again you know we knew what was going to happen next so we knew before we knocked him down again we have to get him out and so when you watch the script that's sort of what happened so for example he's excited to have Mike Shiner in the thing and then boom act one was a dude that the preview comes and the guy destroys the fact you know and he's like, get rid of him. Now he's knocked down. And then Michael takes Ed out. And this is another scene, by the way, you could have edited. And they're out on the street. He's like, let's go get some coffee. And they go to this bar. And basically, the action is Michael has to put him in his place, right? To correct, to reel him in. Um, the obstacle, if we talk about sort of, again, the Aristotelian, you know, action conflict reverse, which is what we're always striving for, I think. So the action is Michael has to reel Ed in. The conflict is Ed is being stubborn and he's like this isn't even your town this is my fucking town like we're not in Hollywood this is not a backlog this is New York City and this is how we do it. so Michael gets smacked in the in the sort of objection the obstacle of it and at the height of Ed saying you're not even important here nobody, it's frankly in New York nobody gives a shit about you and then the tourist comes up and goes are you Egan Thompson and she marginalizes Mike by making him take a picture of them so she doesn't even recognize who, who the great theater actor is she just knows Birdman um, and that's the reverse, right? That's the reversal. So action conflict, and then there's your reverse. So measuring where Regan was going to be at any given time is to, is to take him on a journey, build him up, give him some hope, you know, and then knock him down again. <laughs> um, and that's a series of, you know, that's the Candide-esque, uh, you know, vision of, of, of a character who's eternally, fundamentally optimistic, but just things keep falling on his head. And, and that's how he measured his Regan's line. And he would slowly spiral out of his sanity. You know, Birdman, as you watch the movie, sort of gets louder and more prominent. In the first scene, it's a poster in the background. And, of course, by the third act, it's, it's this guy flying behind him, you know. So that his brain is sort of switching over. So it, that sort of spiral of losing his sanity is, it, it, is also in play the whole time. Now, are you always aware of how you're bringing an audience in and letting them access the story through, like, say, for example, letting them figure things out and put things together in order to kind of pull them into the story further? Well, I mean, I think fundamentally that's that's good writing. I don't know how conscious I am of it while I'm writing. I think you want to leave questions open. I talk to my writers in my writer my, my writer's room for the TV show. Nico and I are, are running that room and writing the show, and then we have three playwrights, three women who are talented women, um, Tanya Barfield, Hallie Pfeiffer, and uh, Molly Reitzel. And I talk to them so much about, let's not get caught in the trap of, that character would never do that. Because that's the trap. If you can predict what a character will do, then the audience can too, and they have nothing to wait for. So rather than saying, for example, Regan would never do that, you start with the question, why did he do that? That's insane. I didn't think he would do that. Why did he? And when you start searching for those answers, you get to a place where the audience isn't ahead of you. You know? So you, you just, I think you fundamentally, you always want to leave questions for the audience. You don't want to answer questions for the audience. So well, there, there's a moment that I absolutely love that's, that's kind of not one of the major moments, but after Michael Keaton has... Um, he, you know, he fell asleep out. Uh, he gets like a bottle of whiskey, yeah. and you hear the guy like yelling on the road, the and you hear that throughout the whole scene. And he's yelling and yelling and yelling, and you just you kind of assume something about that person. And then as he walks past him, he says that he's an actor and he's kind of like auditioning in a way. And it's a completely different like what's happening with that. It's like a layer that you weren't even really thinking about, and it's just like adds a little something on top of 
the actual scene that's going on. And I, I just thought that was pretty amazing. But I didn't know what you what your take on, was on something like that. Well, that scene that was, it was, it was sort of manifested itself in different ways. Uh, he's doing the, the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech for Macbeth. Um, life is but a walking shadow of four players struck and swept, fresh his moment on the stage and was heard from no more to the tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And that's really what we're talking about with Regan and this movie. Um, but also you have this homeless guy or bum, it sounds like, who's just spewing out this monologue, which in essence highlights Regan's mediocrity, um, and then Regan gets to him. It's a flashback, if you notice, to um, the brilliant Jeremy Shamos, who plays the bad actor in the beginning. And he overacts, and he looks at Regan and says, is that too much? It's too much of an I can see on your face. I, I just wanted to give you a range. And this crazy guy in the street utters the same line. So he speaks out the monologue and then looks at Regan and says, is that too much? I just give you a range and you see Michael look at him so it's really Michael's brain starting to to come apart on him you know and those weird lights there's no reason for those rings of lights to be there but just the genius of Alejandro you know <laughs> um, so yeah there is a mediocrity shouting at him on the street you know right now can you talk a little bit about um, there were some things that I wanted to ask you about what Michael Keaton's character is going through. Um, you know, when, when the climax happens, when, you know, we've had this buildup of Birdman that starts out as a voice in his head, then becomes an actual, you know, person following him around. And then finally, um, it appears that he just kind of, what, what's happening there? Is he, does he accept it and like start believing the voice and kind of, uh, my, my, idea on it was that he was kind of going insane, but it felt good. Like it was like a comfy feeling to embrace yeah. that finally. Yeah. And I think that's what, what, that's what Regan says when, uh, when he's on his dressing room table talking to his ex-wife. And he says, right. I, I have this voice in my head and it's scary, but it's comforting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think when all is lost for him at sort of the top of the third act, which is where the critics are saying, I'm going to kill your play. Cause that was the last hope he had. Right, right. Like this thing being a success, and she basically says before the third act, you, you lose, I win, and now we're in a place where we're like, well, uh, wait a minute, it has to be a success. I mean, how could it? Um, so then he has to drink, and he, and he spews out his his monologue to her, and and goes to get that so like you were saying. And then when he wakes up, basically the voice in his head is saying, forget those people, forget everything else. You're a legend, and you can still be a legend. And he says, let's go back to that theater and show them one more time what we're capable of. Show them one more time. Give them something they'll never forget. So he's saying, go and be the legend that you are. Uh, later on, we'll come to understand that that has to do with the real gun and, and, and what happens on stage. He gives the most honest moment of his life. Because in that scene, he's not talking about the scene itself. And I think that was an interesting scene to write, is the play, with, play within the play. Because when you, it happens three times. And when you hear it the first time and he says, um, you don't love me. You never will. Why do I have to beg you to love me? I, I, I'm, I don't exist. I don't exist. It, 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 in the first one, he has the wig on and it disappears in the comedy of Ed Norton's erection. And so the, the, the farce of that makes you not listen to what he's saying a little bit. It's a diversion. The second time he says it is when he walks in from the street in his underwear and he has a, he's holding his fingers out like a gun. And you realize he's starting to lose his shit, so you hear the words a little bit, but it's the same words. Why do I have to get you to love me? Why don't you love me? I, all I want is that. I don't exist. I don't even exist. You don't love me. And we don't hear it yet again. We hear it, but don't hear it, because we're watching in his underwear. We're laughing at the uncomfortable mania of the scene. And then the third one, when he walks on with a loaded gun, we realize he's not talking to her. He's saying the lines, and the lines mean it to him. He's asking his audience, right? Why don't you love me anymore? All I ever wanted was for you to love me. And you don't, and you never will. I don't exist. And, it's the and for the first time, it's really just a way of meeting to him. So he has this very pure moment on the stage. Because he's telling the truth. He's asking his fame, his audience, his family. He's asking everybody, why don't you love me? All I want is to be lost. Um, and then goes ahead and, and and gives them something they'll never forget. Um, 
So Birdman plays the part in that, in that, in that third act when it finally comes to life. He, it's that argument that you, you may not be great at this. You may not be a great actor, but you're a legend. And, and go and be that. And that for Michael, it, it's him embracing, read the Thompson Michael Keaton as the actor. It's him embracing what he is. You know, for that moment. Right. Yeah. Now, right before that, it shows that the show is actually being having success, right? I mean, he's got flowers in the room that we show a scene of people talking about how good the show is. Yeah. So is that intentional that it's like he's actually having success, but this that doesn't really even matter to him? He's like no, already... he, he, yeah, he's in the, this performance before and after. He's giving the most honest performance of his life. So when we come in, we realize, oh, like he's not manic. He's laying down very calm on the table. His wife says, you're, you know, you're really calm. And he's like, yeah, I yeah. am. Because he's embraced it. Right. And so he's on stage, you know, if you look at the backstory of that scene, he's on stage playing a mediocre person, being a mediocre person, and he's obviously doing well at it. Um, so in accepting himself, he finally did the best job he could on the stage. Now, if we can, for uh, a few minutes, I, I was hoping we could talk about the actual filming process and what it was like kind of being around Alejandro and Chivo and seeing them work. Do you, do you, is that okay if we go into that for just a little bit? Of course, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, for all was the, it, well, let me, let me ask you, was, yeah. uh, was when you guys first started, I assumed that all the actors were a little, you know, cold and like not really like, sure how everything was going to work was it was it the process of shooting everything straight like that in single takes was that something that you guys had to you know develop and get get more comfortable with Alejandro had rehearsed them I think the main thing on the set of Birdman was everybody was appropriately scared shit <laughs> do you know what I mean the, yeah. uh, thank god when we got there the writers most of our work was done already and we were scared shit like months before that <laughs> so we, we sort of passed on the, the baton but the actors right. were appropriately scared, you know, you know, not terrified, but appropriately scared because, and, and so were the gaffers and so were the cameramen and so was everybody. Because if you were the one that screwed up a 12 minute take, you know, it, it was going to feel bad. <laughs> so everybody was sort of, you know, you always hear Emma or Zach talk on television shows about how, you know, like Zach, like Michael does that scene in the dressing room where he's just, Bearing his soul when he's like, you know, it's truly really a pursuit question. He just gives it all. Everything there is to give that Michael have, Keaton has, he gave in that scene. And of course, Zach has to come in at the end of it and go, how you doing, buddy? And, and, and Zach was like, if I fuck that line up, pardon my language, if I screw this up, like, what am I going to do? Look at Michael and say, oh, sorry, buddy, can you do that again? <laughs> you know? Um, and same with Emma, you know, when she comes on after Ed Norton and Michael Keaton in their first sort of bombastic, exciting, long scene, and she just comes on taking costumes, and she was appropriately scared, which is to say, if I blow this, then I was wasting that whole 10 minutes of she just did. Um, so Alejandro and Chilo had it choreographed in advance. They rehearsed twice, once with stand-ins in Los Angeles and once with the actors in New York. Um, and that camera was choreographed from first to last moment, meticulously. And to know what they went through was, and to watch them work is, is, is simply a master class. Like, if you're going to get to write, God willing, you get to write with Alejandro directing and Chilo shooting, because they're as good as it gets. I mean, they're as good as it gets. They're masters. And we'd be sitting on the stage, and we'd need, like, a plug line, like something to fill in some space, and they'd be like, this is what the camera's doing. And they would talk at 60 miles an hour, and I'd be like, just trying to keep up, you know, just trying to keep up. And she would be like, we're going to move here and talk here, and I'll have to write the light that's come from here. So when you see words, it's somebody and you're like, oh, yeah. Um, you so they must, they have kind of a shorthand of just like, I mean, they've been working together for so long that they just kind of can finish each other's sentences, I assume. Well, they just, I think, uh, unless I'm mistaken, this is their first time working together. Um, she will work with, right? with Quaron, uh a bunch. Oh, Cron. that's okay. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, Roger, I, 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 Roger for Prieto, some reason, I thought Roger, they had worked together. Right. No, uh, Rodrigo Prieto, I think, did like Babel and, uh, and 21 Grams and Beautiful, um, who's another genius. Um, but they did develop the shorthand and awfully quickly. Like, they both knew what sort of jazz they were playing. And, and, and they're amazing. I learned so much uh, watching them. And they're also both 
aside of being visionary, they're both the most generous human beings. So they don't they don't leave you out of it. You know, they always they, they, Alejandro embraces ideas from everywhere. Like he's not one of those people that don't talk to me. You don't know what you're talking. He'll listen because if he if he hears one sentence from anybody, but it's the right sentence, he's on it. Like he doesn't. He has no sort of um, wall, no distance, no pedestal that he stands on. He's in the dirt with you. Um, I think that's why actors react so well, and that's why they, movie after movie, everybody he directs gets nominated for something somewhere because he, he stands right there in the trenches with them, and they trust him, and then you get performances like the ones you saw here from Michael or Bardem in, in uh, Beautiful or Emma in this movie, which nobody sort of expected except she's a, you know, I mean, she's really a monster actor. Um, but he, he gets there because people have faith and trust. And the writers do, too. Writing with him is the same experience. You just trust that he's, that his compass is right and that he embraces good ideas and that he gets enthusiastic and energetic. And it's, it's a really, I mean, I'd like to give you dirt, but it's a dream co- collaboration. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we're, not, we're not a gossip uh, yeah. show. It's, okay. it's a dream for any writer out there. I mean, God, it's easy for me now to say, hey, you should work with Alejandro. You know, it's so <laughs> Sure. Yeah, you know, if you have a chance, why not? Um, <laughs> but working with somebody like that, somebody who's open and generous, and that you just have this faith that if you jump, you're going to be okay. Like, if you throw in a shitty idea, it's going to be okay. Like, that's an amazing thing have on a set. And I, I think it, 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 in this case, it, it was the reason that this movie in the end uh, hopefully worked. Now what, this was probably, was this, you know, have, had you been on film sets before or was this kind of the first the time first, you had really been, yeah. Yeah, this is the first one I was totally immersed in. They shot here in uh-huh. New York and, you know, again, the rewriting consisted of slug lines, like the camera's taking a little longer than we thought to get there, can we extend this, or do you have another thought here? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's the first time that I stood on set sort of with the cans on, the monitor, watching it happen, watching the director and cinematographer work, watching the actors up close. It, it was really amazing. Now, for the people who listen to this who are, you know, directors and cinematographers, we, we you know, that's something that we cover a lot. Can you talk about anything you learned just by watching them or anything that surprised you about the way they worked? I think, I don't, well, I'm going to go backwards and, and do a callback. I, I, found something, <laughs> I found something surprisingly inevitable. Um, and that is that both Chilo and Alejandro shoot intuitively from a place of action. So when they decide what the camera is going to do next, it's because they're living inside the character with the action shoes. And this is why, this is what separates the, the grown-ups from the kids, is that if you look at Emma's monologue with Michael, right, Every 99% of the people out there would have stayed on Michael, right? They would have been on a monologue, and it would have been all about Michael's reaction to it. Except they dealt with it from Emma's point of view because they knew she was the one with the action. She was getting, she was exacting revenge on her father. And in the end, the reverse of that scene, again, I'm boring you with action conflict reverse, right? But in the end, the reverse of that scene is the overwhelming dissatisfaction and guilt that comes from how the, the, the way it, it turns back on her. And then if you remember in that scene, so she fires away and she says, you are not important, get used to it. And she and Alejandro stay right on Emma, on those big old eyes of hers. And you watch the regret come over like a tidal wave, which is brilliant on Emma's part. It's brilliant on Alejandro and Chiva's part to have it there. And so they come from a place in any scene where they're following the action. So the camera is inside the person. It's a very subjective experience, right? The camera reflects what any given character is feeling. And in the case of Birdman, most of the time, overwhelmingly most of the time, that's, that's Regan Thompson. But sometimes it's um, Ed Norton, and sometimes it's Emma Stone, and sometimes it was Naomi Watts. Um, but the camera lives inside their point of view. And I think that's what makes these films seem so... Like you're sneaking a peek in, into the, you know, insides of people, you know. Um, that's how they do it. And they do it aggressively. Like they put the camera six inches away from somebody's face at some times. It's brave of the actors to, to go through. But that was something I learned. That, that outside of their, their, their mastery of the process itself, of the photography, of the process of wrecking, outside of that, 
they're going from a pure storyteller place. They're telling the story subjectively through the character with the action. And I think that's an amazing lesson that I'll, I'll keep with me forever. Now, I assume that there's no room for egos or anything. Everybody's just there to, to work hard. And I mean, one of the things that I hear from the set is just there were, there were tons of, you know, mistakes and errors and they just like had to keep going and keep going until they got it right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the benefit of everybody being on the, on the high wire together. You can't blame any, you can't blame anybody for falling off. Yeah. I mean, one, it naturally keeps your ego in check because if you're going to be the one with the ego, and you screw up a scene, that's going to be humiliating, you know. Uh, but two, everybody knows how dangerous it was. So if somebody were to trip up, you know, Anna did a bunch, everybody totally understood it. And then when she came back, she fired away and gave you those takes that you see on the screen. Do you know what I mean? So everybody, everybody knew the risk level, so there was a great amount of respect um, for everybody. Like for the, again, for the cameraman, for the gaffers, for the, you know, for everybody. There was a great amount of respect because everybody knew they could be the one to let the team down, and nobody wanted to do that. Right. Now, do you do you know what Alejandro's feelings were about, like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of kind of, a little bit of, I guess, mocking about blockbusters and movies kind of like, uh, you know, I guess Iron Man and the Avengers and stuff like that. I mean, what what is his take on movies like that? And possibly what to, what what do you did he ever discuss like how he feels about say batman which is obviously has to be something that was you know in the air i don't think you know it's funny i think people misunderstood a, a joke he, english is a second language and and yeah. sometimes his jokes don't <laughs> don't come out the right way and in one <laughs> interview he, he made a joke referring to the film about the cultural genocide and I think it got misconstrued. I know him personally. Right. I know him well. I can, I'm can. i proud to call him a friend. And he likes good movies. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So if there's a well done, you know, whatever you want to call him, studio, Hollywood, you know, superhero, but he's going to like it. He just respects good work. Um, right. I think what he can't abide himself is like gratuitous work that, that imagines that it's important. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's funny because that's what people accuse him of being self-important. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, which is really funny because I, I guess in a way we're all self-important. That's the Regan Thompson at all. But nothing mm -hmm. amuses me more than the people that came out criticizing Birdman, who are, who are saying, "Oh, the film's just they're so self-important, patting themselves on the back. The film likes itself so much that I don't have to like it." And you're like, right. if you could have just pictured us like uh, 18 months ago, all literally. Pooping our pants, scared to <laughs> death. Like, like, no, it's never gonna work. We're dead. We're, we, this is horrible. Like, why do we even do this? Like, you know, like the insecurity and doubt and fear. Like, I, I think people like picture us in a room going, "Hey, you know how we could fuck with an audience next? We could just." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so the opposite of that. Um, but, but back to the original question, it, it, I think that Alejandro likes good movies, and I think there are right. superhero movies and or Hollywood films that he's seen and really, really like. Um, and if, if it's gratuitous, I think if he feels it's gratuitous, and I can't really have to ask Alejandro this question, but this is my interpretation of it. If right, he right. feels it's gratuitous and, um, you know, manufactured, he's not going to like it. And you can tell by any of his movies, that wouldn't be his cup of tea, you know. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I think that's how he feels. I don't think as a person, this was about the story we were writing. I think everybody took it part, you know, we made fun of everybody. We made fun of writers. We made fun of uh, actors. We made fun of critics. I mean, the critics, there's another thing. Critics were like, oh, it, it's unbelievable that the critic would judge it. You're like, oh, my God, it's a movie. Like, we're not... The only thing that trips up the critic in our movie is her ego, just like everybody else. She has a, she has a great point when she says to him, look, you, you come here untrained. You've never been on a stage before, and yet you take over the Broadway theater. You guys, you, you hand each other awards for cartoons and pornography. You measure your work in weekends. All these things are true, and when we screened it for the executive Fox, you could see everybody like flinking down in their chairs a little bit. And then Michael <laughs> comes back and says, "This is what we do. This costs you nothing." And he gives his argument back. Their argument is just as good. But what trips her up is she says, "I'm going to ruin the play because I hate you," and she thinks for herself that she's capable of ruining his play or the experience. Uh -huh. And so her problem is exactly the same as Regan's problem, which is the exact same as Mike's problem, which is ego. And that's what the movie's about. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Now, that, that's actually one of my favorite scenes that, that, you know, confrontation between the two of them. Like writing a scene like that, I don't know if that was one of the ones you like focused on, but I mean, when you're in that, like, you know, in a argument that, you know, um, intense, like, are you writing both sides? Like, are you seeing one point of view and yeah. then you go back and write the dialogue yeah. and then you're back at it again? Yeah. And that was one of the ones because I had a, I had a, a bumpy experience. Um, well, <laughs> I, I had a bumpy experience in my life as we all have with, with critics. Um, yeah. but it wasn't about any measure of revenge at all. If, if you don't give her a good argument there, then it's his monologue is, that scene doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you, make a boxing picture and you, you don't make a good opponent. Do you know what I mean? If it's not scary, it, it doesn't work. Right. She comes mm-hmm. in with a very honest argument. She's like, you are untrained at what you're trying to do here, and it's your ego that makes you think you can do it. And that hits him hard. Mm-hmm. Um, then he can come back and say, yeah, but I'm trying it. Do you know what I mean? Just like Ed Norton sort of says at the beginning with her, which is a scene I like, which I also... So I worked on this critic thing. Um... And Ed Norton had just gotten a beat down because the, the tourist had recognized Michael instead of him. Mm-hmm. And then he crosses over and the critic sees him and she says, you go to Hollywood? He says, Hollywood's coming here. She says, good luck with that. And he does the Flaubert quote, which is a man becomes a critic when he cannot be a soldier the same way a, 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 a man becomes a critic when he cannot be an artist the same way a soldier becomes an informant when he can't be a soldier. Um, mm-hmm. And she says, he's a clown in a Lycra bird suit. And Ned Norton, who has every reason to throw Regan under the bus, replies, yeah, but tomorrow night at 8 o'clock he'll be on that stage risking everything. What will you be doing? Um, the arguments are strong on both sides. I mean, you think about writing a scene like Michael and the Clays, you have to book, give them both a very strong argument. Otherwise, it's, right. it's unimportant. It's, otherwise, it's standing out so far. Mm-hmm. I think critics are very touchy about that scene. I don't... They, <laughs> even, even critics who really like the movie were touchy about the scene. I'm, I'm, you know, again, I, we, were, we made fun of everybody. And in the end, right. I, I defy any of them to tell me that scene wasn't about ego. Um, and it wasn't about taking cheap shots or doing a fantasy about critics. That's their ego of the critics writing about the critic scene, saying, you know, we were having our revenge fantasy on critics. Yes, we were. Right? We were writing a movie, and she's Michael's obstacle, and her, her flaw is the same as his, which is ego. So it was mm. all in the structuring of the scene. Now, was there any sense on set, I mean, I personally am a huge, you know, Michael Keaton fan and everything. Was there the sense like that this was going to be, I I know you've said in the past that you never had any expectation of how, you know, big this was going to be. And obviously the the Oscar win and all that, but was there a sense with Michael that it's like, he, he really hadn't been, you know, starred in a lot of movies. Of course we all grew up in the eighties and he was just huge back then with Mr. Mom and um, Johnny, Johnny, of course. yeah, Yeah. Huge. And so one of the when I first saw that this was being made, I didn't have I mean, I thought it was like going to be a superhero movie. I didn't know anything about it. Um, But the thing that really excited me was like, oh, Michael Keaton, you know, maybe this will be like something that he gets back into. You know, some people have been talking about Beetlejuice, too, and all this other stuff. Um, But was there that sense? I mean, maybe even just with you that like this is pretty cool that Michael Keaton's like kind of really kicking some ass here. We were pretty excited when when. We sort of, we were all four writers were sitting together and, and his name came up, you know. Um, all of a sudden we were like, yeah, man, that is a good idea. And then fortunately he liked us with him and Alejandro met with him and they got along. Um, yeah, I think once you saw him, even at the table read, the first table read we did out in LA, um, there was a sense of, oh boy, like this guy is going to be awfully good in this role, awfully good. And then once you saw him on set, it was otherworldly. I mean, I could tell you stories about that another time, but um, there are moments when he came on stage and I was just, one of them was that last scene when he comes on, he sort of titters to himself, I'm not, in, I don't exist. And you you could, nobody was breathing backstage. It was so electrifying. I mean, nobody was breathing. And yeah, for me who grew up with Michael Keaton, I'm 46 years old, so uh, I grew up right at that time with Michael Keaton. It was um, amazing. And I'm sorry he didn't win awards or silly things in a way. I mean, they're great. We want them so nice to be acknowledged. And it really is an honor, especially with the people that you're with. In my case, and the other writers who are, to a man, I, I didn't meet, um, Jillian Flynn, but the guys I met, you know, the, the 
Anthony McCartan and 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 uh, Jason, who wrote American Sniper, and Graham and Max Fry. Like they're such great people. Um, but Michael is such a big part of that movie uh, uh, that we don't accept that award without him. And you, if you watched on the awards, we were sort of holding our awards out to him um, when Alejandro brought his name up because he was that important to the film. Um, as was, by the way, Antonio Sanchez and Drummer, but that's a different story. Um, but, but Michael's was this movie, and you don't win the best screenplay Oscar. It doesn't sit on my shelf, and I don't get to call myself an Oscar winner for the rest of my life without Michael Keaton. Impossible. No other human being can do that for me, and I, I'll owe him that forever, and he's a, he's a tremendous person and a tremendous actor. Yeah, definitely. And to pull off what he pulled off, I mean, drama, comedy, timing, farce. Yeah, well, it's just like you watch that and you think, man, where has he been? You know what I mean? It's like he's yeah. such, uh, uh, you know, it was just so much fun to watch him that I, I just remember thinking, man, it's just like you wish that. I mean, it was kind of like almost like seeing, you know, some of these other people that were huge and then like went through a period of time, like say, uh, like seeing John Travolta in Pulp Fiction or seeing Mickey Rourke in The Fighter or the, not wrestler, the, fighter, yeah. the wrestler. Yeah, yeah, the wrestler. Yeah, it was just like it was the same feeling. I mean, but even more so, you know, just because Michael Keaton. I mean, it's like the new generation doesn't, you know, have any concept of how. I mean, they might have seen his older stuff, but you know, they had never, no concept I, of how great he was. I don't know that he ever got a chance to do as much as there. And I think he would say that too. And I think he has said that in interviews. Like even when Michael Keaton was great, which was all of fame, great, um, he never had the opportunity to do all of that. Like the the different notes that he hits in Birdman, or how, how many actors could nail the timing, the comedy, the tragedy, the Buster Keaton of it all, the drama. Um, how many actors could hit all those notes that well? I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a short list. I'll say that. It's a really short list. I mean, I, just, I almost defy you to find somebody else that could do what Michael did in that movie. Um, and again, and again, no, I, I, sorry story. about that. No, it's okay. Go ahead. No, I'm just reminding myself how much I love him. He, he's just a, he's a <laughs> terrific guy. Do you think you'll have the opportunity to to work together again? I, I pray I do. I am, I'm I'm gonna beg him to be. I wrote a baseball because he loves baseball, so um, we got. <laughs> I'll beg him later on, but uh, I hope so. I, I'd be lucky to. Now I'm I'm curious about something that that I haven't heard you talk about, and that's the the Spanish English part of of working together. Do you guys? Now I, I actually live in Mexico, so my, oh, my no. wife is Mexican. So um, you know, it's always intriguing to me because you know Alejandro is Mexican, Chivo is Mexican. You you have your Puerto Rican background, or I know I'm, you're from I'm, New York. A, I'm, a, I'm a New Yorker. Yeah, my, my parents were both born here. My mother's parents were born in Cuba. Her father was born in Havana. Her mother was born in Punta, Puerto Rico. And my okay. father's side is Armenian. Ah, okay. So but you did, was there any? Were you when you were doing when you work with like for example with Nico and those guys who are from Argentina, is everything in English or are you guys like do you do you speak Spanish at all or they are they are very courteous to me and always speak English. <laughs> um, I always tell them when they get when they get tripped up that they can they can go ahead and speak in Spanish because I understand enough of it to to you know to to let them speak because sometimes they can't express themselves. Um, but they're incredibly generous and, and generally always in our Skype and everything else. We, Always speak in English unless I got tripped up, and then sometimes they'll be like, "Just talk to each other in Spanish. You're fine. I'll follow you." <laughs> um, but yeah, it, but that, but was that one of the reasons why you know? Because you know, I, I speak Spanish down here, but you know, there's no way I've got. For example, I, I'm I'm working on a screenplay, and I, I've got a one of my actors doesn't speak English, and I have to write dialogue for him in Spanish. So I know that I'm never going to be able to put something that sounds right or whatever. So are you kind of the you know, gatekeeper with that in a way, like making sure yeah. that everything sounds right? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Nico would write scenes, Alejandro would, would, would write monologues and, and, and such, and then hand it off to me. And it helps that we understand each other um, really well. I mean, we have a very, it's a very good team um, in the best way. And I think if people that see four names on the screen, are like, oh, one guy wrote it, another guy came back. And that wasn't our case. We all wrote it together, you know. Um, but yeah, it was, it was my job to turn it into the language that seemed consistent. And I hope that if Birdman, you watch it from the end, there's a few points where you might trip up and go, oh, that doesn't exactly sound. Um, but for the most part, I think it has one voice. And that, that voice is me 
speaking for all of us, you know, in in that sort of pattery New Yorky um, modern colloquial way. Um, so yeah, they trusted me with they trusted me with making the dialogue sound, <laughs> um, you know, sound authentic and right. and, and yeah. have a, it needed to have a rhythm. And, okay. Yeah, writing in a subject like a language, as you know, to try to find a rhythm is very very difficult. Now, have you, working with, with Nico as much as you have, have worked, have you learned things from him, from his style, or do you guys kind of learn from each other? For sure, yeah. Nico and I, it's the oddest relationship because we're practically brothers now. And I guess we've <laughs> but you met on this, right? I mean, it's not the first yeah. time working together. And in the oddest circumstances, because I was on, I helped Alejandro in the early drafts of Beautiful, mm -hmm. and then I left that project, and he brought in Nico, um, and... When he called for Birdman, he, he called us both up. I, he called me because I'm going to work on Beautiful. And then when he called for Birdman, he called me and said, hey, how would you like to work with these guys who did Beautiful? And I said, sure. So when we met, you can imagine how strange that was. You know, like two different girlfriends of Alejandro's, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> and it took about two meetings before we realized, oh, oh, that guy, I love that guy. And, and I think we have a, almost too healthy of those of mutual respect. Um, to answer your question about what you learned from Nico, Nico is my alter ego in a way. When I talk to you about structure and making everything make sense, Nico has this, he's a novelist as well as a screenwriter, and he has the mind of a, of a poet. And he allows himself the freedom to think way outside the box. Um, and I think that's part of the extravagance, and I mean that in a good way, of Birdman. Um, and I think the combination of things of our two styles. You know, I drive him crazy because I'm always asking why, 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 why. Um, <laughs> and I think it drives him bananas, um, but he respects it. And on the other hand, he'll say, could you just relax, like breathe and think outside? What What if Michael wrote a sheep, you know, down the street? You're like, oh, right. And it might not be a sheep down the street, but then you might end up with, you know, him flying, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the power of Nico. So it's the ability to sort of let your imagination. Don't be a slave to your to your technique. You know, just to let it. Sometimes just let it fly. And it's been a, right. it's been a great lesson. And he's a great collaborator. He and I right now are in the writers' room for the TV show and just having a great time of it. Um, whether or not it stinks, we'll find out. But um, we're, having, <laughs> we're having a good time writing it. Right. That's the one percent, right? You guys are working. Are you are you working on like the? Are you on the blueprint stage? Or are you guys like cranking no, up we, the scripts? We, yeah, we're, we're we're in scripts. Uh, we got a little extra okay. time because Alejandro's up in uh, Calgary with the Revenant, so we had a little cushion of time. Um, we have to write ten. I think we're somewhere on the six mark right now. Um, but we're taking our time trying to do it right, um, and it's exciting. It's a very difficult show. It's very exciting. Uh, seemingly impossibly complex story to tell, but, um, you know, with him at my side, I feel like we can, we can, we can do it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Uh, let me, uh, I, I always end the, the podcast with two main questions. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask, uh, you know, is what what have been your influences? What are your favorite kind of screenplays or what have the, even, um, plays or, or what are the things that have really influenced you and what are some um are there any books that have influenced you in terms of you know like the hero's journey i know you had mentioned is is one of your books that you like but what what resources for other filmmakers do you think you could recommend um the movies and screenplays that influenced me were the ones I grew up with. I, I started watching movies very young. I lived across the street from this movie theater. I used to sneak in and watch movies over and over. That's when they just had one movie at a time and it just kept repeating. Um, <laughs> so those were the screenplays like And Justice for All, Levinson and Curtin, um, Network, Great Santini, Breaking Away. Um, those were like Kramer versus Kramer. Um, that sort of character-driven drama were always mm -hmm. my favorite. Um, though I do like the, the sort of bigger ones as well. Like Amadeus is one of my favorite films of all time as well. Um, but I like things that, that, that are really heavy into, into character. Um, I'm mm -hmm. less, I'm less likely to like something that's concept driven. You know what I mean? I, I appreciate them, but I do not my cup of tea. Um, okay. 
I won't name it and insult anybody because they're great movies, but I think you know what, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, right. and, and for me, I, I don't read a lot of novels, but I read endlessly biographies on writers. I'll read any book anybody gives me on theory. Mm -hmm. Um, I must have read, you know, Mamet and Goldman, um, you know, their essay books, I don't know, a thousand times. I have like multiple copies around my house, Three Uses of the Knife, uh, uh, Which Line Did I Tell, um, I'm, I'm always fascinated. And then I read biographies of writers, like the Soroyan. I love the William Soroyan biography. Uh, anyway, if you look at my shelves, it's all that, that stuff. And it always started, I read something and I'm inspired to write, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's that. And, and, and I, I still haven't stopped. I'm, I'm 46 years old and I will still pick up any book I find on theory. You know, I'll, sometimes <laughs> I'll read seven pages in and think, okay, this is crap. Um, <laughs> but I'll start it, and if it's even halfway interesting, I'll read it because it just reminds me of what I know, even when I'm disagreeing um, with it. And for right. me, like I said, my foundation is entirely based on on, on structure and theory. So um, those are the books that sort of um, really inspire me. William Ball had a very simple book called The Sense of Direction um, that's just so eloquent about the actor and about... Um, I, I love those. I love those sorts of books, and they inspire me. I'm writing those down real quick. <laughs> yeah, I can the walk sense my, of direction. I can watch my shelves and, and look at those, the ones I want. Like Harold Clarnon. Yeah, I I, I love that too. You know, I uh, sorry, go ahead. Harold Clarnon on directing. It's an okay. amazing book. It's just about theater, but it's an amazing book on sort of the structure of storytelling. Do you have any any plans to try and direct a film in the future? You know, it, it had come up a lot, and I wasn't. I, I've been very afraid to do that because I'm, this, as you can tell from this whole conversation, I, I very much need to know what I'm doing. And people would say, <laughs> "Well, surround yourself with good people," and I believe that, but I, I sort of want to learn what I'm doing first. Um, mm -hmm. But there has been talk of it, and I think I'm just going to watch on on set for a little while, but. I do have my, there's a play I wrote. Actually, it was a play that Alejandro read when he first got in touch with me, um, that he loved and called me to work with him in the beginning. Stages are beautiful. And it's a play called Still Life. Um, mm -hmm. And I wrote it. It's published. Uh, uh, and I'm going to adapt it into a screenplay this summer. Mm -hmm. um, and if I was going to direct, that might be the first one because it's so personal and I know it intimately and um, and I have some great people who worked on Birdman who who said they were willing to work with me on it. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I may finally do that, but I, I, w I won't do it unless I feel like I, I, my baseball movie will probably be shot first. I wrote a baseball movie called The Year of the Monarchs and we're producing it with Mandalay and um, I think that I'll stay very close to whoever the director is um, if they let me. I certainly stayed close to Alejandro. Alejandro said when I'm ready to do it that, that he would be there in any capacity I needed to, to help, which is an amazing, yeah. uh, amazing asset. Um, uh, perhaps Guillermo well, I know a lot of people that would pretty much, you know, give everything they have to sit beside Alejandro and Chivo and just like see that whole, you know, just what they're doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a master class right there. It's a master class. It really is every single day. Um, so yeah, so I may do it with my with my play still life. I, I, that may be the one, maybe sometime in 2016. Now, one of the the things I had been writing not too um, long ago, just you reminded me of this, um, was the idea of of you know when when you're financing movies and putting all these movies together. One of the things that um, we try to do is talk about how first time filmmakers can make their first film, and one of the big ideas with that is trying to make a film that only takes place in one location. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts, because I know that writing a play is similar to kind of having to make, you know, I had heard that one of the main things that you have to do is take your character and instead of having all these outward things that happen to them, that you, you more, you have to like track the, the inward journey of them and like, where are they at this moment? And I know we kind of already talked about that. I just wonder if you had any more 
thoughts well, on that? Re, re, just rephrase the question for me. Okay, so what is the secret <laughs> of writing a screenplay that takes place in one location and is primarily character and dialogue based versus action and we can go to a million different locations and have car chases what what is the real key to being able to write that kind of screenplay uh scenes scenes i think larry kazan once said to me it's sort of you know i love talking to these people because like the genius just stills out of their mouth like it's ready to say something you're like what, what did you just say like i think that was I think that's going to be in my Bible, you know? And last, <laughs> like, like Sam is saying, two characters agree to scenes over. Like, what? That's G-? And he just half flipped it out of his mouth. Um, but Larry once said to me, you know, if you have enough scenes that are good scenes that are pertinent to the plot and the structure, you know, seven, eight, nine good scenes, you've got a movie. The rest will come together. Um, mm-hmm. I think the trick of being in one place, when you try to think of the best movies that were shot that way, I mean, I know they went out, outside a little bit, Mm, there's a more dogs is a lot in that warehouse in mm-hmm. and around that warehouse. Um, they do have flashbacks, you know, to the office or the heist or the leading car, but it's very brief. I'm trying to think of the, what are the most successful movies that did that? Just um, one location. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, like 12 angry men is probably the best example. 12 angry men. Or, um, it's cube. I don't know if you ever saw that. Which one? Cube. No. Or maybe it was The but Cube. <laughs> 12, 12 Angry Men is a play, so they just shot the play. That, that naturally is going to yeah. do that. Um, well, that, that's what I'm saying is that I think that, that basically you're shooting a movie that's a play. There's another one that just came out where everybody's in um, – it's called Exam. Right. And it takes place in one room with like six or, or – I think it's like six different people, and they all are given a piece of paper, and um, they all have to like figure out – what the answer to one question is, and right. the whole thing is based on dialogue. And right. The Breakfast Club, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, I think when you look at those movies, and if we, if we look at them and see what they have in common, it's that rather than changing location, they change scene and scene partner. Mm-hmm. I think that when you, if you have gripping scenes, depending on how many characters you have, um, and you can change the feeling... So if it's just two people, for example, Oleana was a David Manet play. That's a good play, but didn't really work as a film um, because it's two people standing in a room talking, basically. Um, in something like The Breakfast Club, he's changed locations minorly. I mean, he went from the library to the hallway once, but they're basically in, in the, the room. Because all the characters, when, when, you, when you combine two different characters, you've got a different feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have multiple characters in the conversation, I think, I think go back to Larry's rule. If you have like interesting characters and you can draw a bunch of really good scenes, then you can survive in a, in a single location. Unless that's the purpose of it, which is like, uh, I guess Locke just now, Tom Hardy, mm-hmm. which is all in the car, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so that's different. That's an artistic experience about being in one location. But if you're trying to make a, the other film, like, you know, Breakfast Club or Reservoir Dogs or, I think it's about interesting scenes. And if you can build enough of them and make the characters really clear, you know, make behavior, separate them by behavior as much as possible. I mean, be, I, and I can't say that. You know, it was a great lesson to me. Behavior is absolutely everything. You know, behavior is mm-hmm. what separates Fredo from Sonny. You know, not the, not the lines in the script as much as the behavior that's in the script. Now, how's that, what is that relative to, I mean, Behavior in terms of just their dialogue and their actions, you mean? They're always their actions. Dialogue mm-hmm. is secondary. You could write okay. the same dialogue for two different characters and then give one behavior and the other, and there'll be two entirely different characters. Right? Okay. Behavior is, is you know, Ed Norton in his brief in the sunbed is behavior. Mm-hmm. And it tells you more about Mike and anything he could say virtually. He comes in the first scene in that hat, standing by the ghost light. That's behavior. You know who he is before <laughs> he opens his mouth, right? He's in profile right. by the ghost light in that hat. Um, you know, in, in, in Michael in his underwear, like the, the, the things that make people <laughs> uniquely themselves. Right, yeah. Did you ever, you've, you've, I assume you've read the Raiders of the Lost Ark screenplay. Yeah, or, <laughs> of course I have. It's annoying. 
annoyingly brilliant. Do you ever talk to him? About, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Lawrence Kasdan fan. Oh, so please. Have to I mean, ask the first that. time I met him, I almost fell down. Right? And it's so funny. <laughs> he's such a jerk because we were doing a table reading of The Bodyguard. Um, uh-huh. so, so I adapted the film into the musical, which we were we did in London, and now we're touring and may come to Broadway soon. But um, So I had adapted his screenplay, and I hadn't met him, but it's Lauren Ethan Kasdan. You know what I mean? It's like... Yeah. I mean, Grand Canyon is one of my favorite movies, let alone anything else. Um, The Big Chill. The Big Chill. We can go on. Amazing. Yeah. um, And he comes into the room with Meg, his wife, who wrote Grand Canyon with him. The first time Mm -hmm. we meet him, I shake his hand. And then as we sit at the table, reading all the actors and myself and the director were at at the table, and they were in chairs, and he literally sits right behind my back. Like, in the (laughs) the room, he's behind me. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, either he's being very gracious as a writer, or he's just playing out trying to intimidate me. It was one of the two. You know, he was just sparing me the, the having to watch his every reaction. <laughs> or he was like, hey, buddy, you know, I'm on your shoulders to watch out. It was one of the two. But either way, it's brilliant move. Um, but yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark is just, I mean, it's epic in every, in every sense of the word. So well written. <laughs> okay, well, let me, uh, you know, you've, you've been really nice and haven't said anything about time. Let me ask you my final question and okay. then I'll I'll leave you in peace. Of course, um, if you could, if, um, well, the last one, the last segment I always call the time machine. So the question is, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself when you were much younger, you know, say your, your 20 year old self, what mm-hmm. advice would you have for yourself? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> First, you could reassure yourself that you had won an Oscar. <laughs> Yeah, and then my 20-year-old so don't self worry. Would, would beat the crap out of my 46-year-old self for lying after I said that. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, I guess I feel lucky. I, I grew up with very little. I, I didn't graduate college. or I, I, I grew up not the greatest of circumstances. Um, I think my, I did one of my advices that I would give my 20-year-old self. I, I did, so it doesn't work, which is to say, you know, study technique, 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 technique. I, I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough. Anybody that thinks that they just can sit down and, you know, write something, you might be able to do it once. You'll never do it. Well, you'll probably never do it twice, and no chance will you do it a third time. So if you're planning a career without knowing a foundation of technique, you're out of your mind. But I sort of did that. But I guess what I would say to my 20-year-old self is, hold on to your voice. Don't try to please people so much. Like, be good to work with. And be a good person that people want to work with. But more than anything, I would have told myself, and it took me a long time to learn this, I would have gone back and said, hold on to your own voice because it's original and nobody else is like it. And I think what we do when we're young is we try to write things or direct things or we, we try to imitate in art. I think that's the nature of artists. We start by imitating until we find our own voice. Um, but to say that my voice was valuable back then, that I wish I would have known, I would have said no less. You know what I mean? I would have told my pompous 20-year-old <laughs> self, know a lot less than you think you do because you don't know anything. Just learn from everybody. Anybody who wants to talk to you, you know, it doesn't hurt to listen. You can always throw it away. Um, but but hold on to your originality. And I think if, if Birdman says anything, it's that there's still a place. And, and by the way, Nightcrawler, Whiplash, this sort of crop of movies this year, if they say anything, they say that there's people still want originality for all the cookie cutter business that's going on right now in storytelling. People still want originality and they will pay attention and they will pay for it and they will reward you for it. And some people will hate you and some people will love you. You know, I said, I said, if one more person told me or, or tweeted, am I the only person that hated Birdman? I'm like, no, you and a billion people hated, like tons of people hated Birdman. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, but it's that thing of making themselves special by saying, am I the only one? No, idiot. There are thousands of people that hate Birdman. <laughs> it's fine to hate Birdman. A lot of people love Birdman. I, I tweeted myself. I was like, it's, 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 it's a film. It's not pizza. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're allowed to not like it. It's fine. It's your opinion and it's perfectly valid. Um, but, but originality will stand out and they'll fight about your movie like Birdman in a good way or you'll fail, but you, it's hard to completely fail if you're being original. And, the only way to be original is to hold on to your own voice, that only you could write it. Only Larry Kasdan can write a script like Larry Kasdan. And when you read one of the scripts, you're like, right, it's Larry Kasdan. Just like 
Bill Goldman or John Logan or Adam Sorkin. You know, you, you read it and you're like, well, I know who that is. You know? So hold, I would tell my 20 year old self to one, know a lot less, stop knowing everything, and two, hold on to the original voice at whatever cost. Alex, it has been a pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. It was totally my pleasure. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully we'll our paths across down the road. All right, that's going to do it for today. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com. <laughs>